Hi, everybody. Welcome to the CAFC uh, Patient Safety Collaborative uh, Monthly Teleconference. It's Tracy Wrong. I'm the Director of Quality at uh, CHEO and one of the co-chairs along with uh, Darlene Bolivar from the IWK. Uh, Darlene is off today and I will be um, uh, leading the today's session. Um, I am going to just take a moment uh, to just sort of welcome any old and new uh, members of those that have been on our calls before. Know that um, we offer a variety of topics on the fourth uh, um, Friday of every month, and uh, this is a, a great one that we have lined up for you today. Um, the Patient Safety Collaborative has a, an opportunity to do a major presentation at the CAFC Annual Conference uh, every October. We hope that you'll be joining us in Toronto this year, and if you want more information, just go to the CAFC website. Um, or contact Lisa Stromquist, who is the uh, patient safety guru in the CAFC office, who can certainly give you some more information. And she's the one who would have sent out the messages about today's teleconference. Uh, okay, so our topic for today, um, this presentation highlights the methodology used and the lessons learned during the implementation of the Pediatric Sepsis Guideline at the BC Children's Hospital. We're really fortunate to have with us today Deb Scott, who um, has worked at the BC Children's Hospital for over 20 years. Her background is in pediatric critical care and emergency nursing, and she has been a direct care nurse, a clinical nurse coordinator, and an educator with the Pediatric Intensive Care and Emergency Department. In 2004, she transitioned into the role of professional practice leader in the Department of Nursing, working on policy development and large-scale hospital initiatives. She became involved in uh, BC Children's Hospital Sepsis Initiative in 2010, working with an interdisciplinary group to adapt the guideline and implement sepsis bundles into clinical practice. So we're really pleased to, uh, to welcome Deb. And um, just to let you know, this will be, there will be an opportunity for interaction with this presentation as uh, Lisa will manage some of the poll questions that we have throughout the presentation. So feel free to join in. And then we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. So at this moment, perhaps uh, I will turn it over to the CAFC office, who will get the technology going for Deb. Hello. Good morning. It's Deb. Hi, Deb. <laughs> Hi there. Sorry, I thought you were turning it back to Lisa for a moment. Well, I was turning it back to Lisa, but that's okay. Deb, why don't you go ahead? If you've got the All technology right. control, then you go right ahead and start the presentation. All right, then. Good morning, everyone. And um, I really would like to say thank you to those at CAFC for providing me the opportunity to make this presentation about BC Children's Hospital's um, experience with implementing our sepsis bundle and guideline. So as a bit of background, Now my slides don't want to go. Yep. There you go. We're good. Oh, I'm good. Oh, okay. Back we go. Okay. As a bit of background, we had um, documented delays in recognition and treatment of sepsis, which had contributed to patient harm. We had taken the um, Surviving Sepsis Guideline and the American Academy of Critical Care Medicine recommendations for sepsis and adapted them for use back in 2008 at Children's. And unfortunately, that go-round had um, failed. We really were not very successful with that implementation. But we knew that implementing a sepsis bundle was the right thing to do because early recognition and intervention leads to better patient outcomes, that improvement bundles um, work, and um, it was important enough for our hospital and our agency and our health authority to actually include it in our 2011-2012 strategic action plan. <clears throat> so we would like to know, um, I think there's a poll question going up for you here about sepsis, if it's a significant problem, if it's managed well, or for the most part managed well but could always be improved. So for everybody, if you could just uh, click on your answer in your room we'll, uh, in, uh, on your computer. Um, we'll uh, leave it open for a little bit and have uh, just for a few seconds and have uh, people answer the question. And then we'll okay. get results. So just give it a couple more seconds. And 
pretty much everybody has uh, voted now, so I am going to close. And we're going to share those results. So it says 22% uh, of the audience says it's a significant problem. Uh, and 78% say for the most part it's managed well, but they could always improve. And nobody says it's uh, managed well alone. So. Oh, very interesting um, that uh, C was uh, such a high percentage. That's great to know. And, um, but of course, as we know, we could always improve. Okay, so for us, we came up with a bit of a problem statement uh, around our issues, which was that um, a lack of a standardized recognition, communication of findings, and response to sepsis, sepsis has led to long lead times from that recognition to response and has caused patient harm. So before we um, launched in again in 2010, we reviewed all our severe sepsis cases that we had had in 2009. And based on um, recommended treatment, within recommended treatment time frames, we had um, demonstrated zero compliance. So we knew we actually had um, <laughs> room for improvement. And so from there, we came up with, um, Lisa, do you have control again? Yeah, you want the, uh, the next question? Uh, next slide, please. And the next question. There we go. We have a question. So in our center, we have a, an established pediatric sepsis guideline that is routinely followed, not routinely followed, or we don't have a guideline. So if everybody could um, please uh, answer that question for us. Just give it a couple more seconds. Okay, we will close it and let's share those results. So 22% said it's routinely followed, 22% say it's not routinely followed, and 56% say we don't have a guideline. Ah, well, very interesting. Um, based on the uh, percentage of the, for the most part, it's managed well, and um, but 56% don't have a guideline. So that's very interesting, because um, I'd love to know more then <laughs> as we move along about measurement and auditing. So moving onwards, our we came up with a primary objective um, for our group which was to implement an internationally recognized sepsis screening tool and treatment protocol. And our key measures was documented timely screening of the appropriate patient population and where required the timeliness of medical intervention. So we knew because of what had gone on in 2008 that we had some barriers that we needed to overcome. And that was kind of confirmed when we began talking to individuals um, during the project that um, they were a little bit skeptical and um, also, we were using um, an improvement methodology that was new to some areas of our hospital. So they weren't familiar with that, and so there was an educational component that had to come into it. Um, some of our cultural influence were, you know, tell me why I should do this. Um, they really wanted hard data in front of them um, to actually believe that it was going to make a difference if they did X, Y, or Z. And so it's difficult to give them that hard data. Um, there was a perception of threatened autonomy with standardization. Uh, clinicians really value um, independent practice, so the idea of having to follow something in a standard way, they felt um, really hindered their autonomy. Um, consensus building was difficult um, due in large part for people to focus on outliers. What about the one-off that comes in? And um, so we had to really try and stick to the 80-20 rule. Um, we had failed once, so that was the why bother. And, um, and a lot of people perceived they actually did this really, really well already. So it was a non-value add for them. We already do this. Why do I need to document this? I, of course, always look for sepsis when I examine a patient, um, but I don't need to write this down or do it in a standardized way. Um, so that was another barrier we had to overcome. So 
the improvement event we did was sort of an inaugural one within our hospital. We had been running rapid process improvement workshops, and if nobody knows what that is, um, I will explain it uh, a bit more if you would like later. And um, we, instead of doing that, which runs for a whole week with um, about a month of prep in advance, we moved on to using a Kaizen event, which actually stands for uh, slow incremental change, um, but they're smaller workshops that are done in fewer days with the people actually doing the work um, at the bedside. And uh, so, yeah, sorry, along. Yeah. yeah. Um, you, your um, um, slides aren't advancing. Oh, that's okay. That was. Okay. Uh, I'm not. I okay. Haven't I just didn't know yet. if you were if you were on to an action. Sorry about that. No, no, that's quite all right. Yeah. So. With our, this is our Kaizen strategy, um, part of our improvement methodology. So this was our timeline for the event. And um, we wanted to be able to create with this Kaizen, we kind of knew what the strategy was, which was implementing the bundle, but we wanted to do it so that it was actually embedded within the care that our staff were doing so that it wasn't an extra thing to do. It was just a natural part of their work. And so with doing these Kaizans, we decided that we needed to roll through the whole hospital and we staggered the events over four weeks so that each of the Kaizen events fed off of um, each other so that the next one or the first one informs the next one which informed the next one. We then realized we had to um, come up with a real communication strategy around that. Um, we involved um, and lots of teams. We had at least six teams running. We had uh, well over 100 individuals. Um, involved in this, and um, that were staff nurses, managers, physicians, physician trainees, pharmacists, quality and safety leaders. Um, so there was a large amount of people involved in this. Our communication strategy that we came up with um, was to brand ourselves. And so um, here it is. We stole shamelessly from the uh, National Health Service and from the Global Sepsis Alliance to come up with our little logo. And um, we packaged our strategy into three themes, which was recognize, respond, and refer. And uh, so we went around and tried to communicate at as many presentations as we possibly could get ourselves to in the hospital, so grand rounds, mortality rounds, academic half days for physician trainees, um, any type of nursing education that was going on. We had all kinds of posters in the elevators, which we changed up with new tidbits of information. But as with any new initiative, people have a level of distrust. So our aim was to work on team building, and um, that communication came in very important as part of that. So with this improvement methodology, um, we moved into um, testing cycles or PDSA cycles, so plan, do, study, act. And so within those cycles, we took some of the strategies that we knew we wanted to implement, but we wanted to actually take them to the users and have them test them, modify them, and that's how we embedded them into practice. So for example, with recognize, we had no standard work around recognition for sepsis. And so it was to develop a screening process. So when to screen, who to screen, how to screen. And so the testing we wanted to know really was it relevant with the patient population we were testing with, um, how long did it take to do, and how often did they do it, and what was the benefit of what they were finding, um, how readable was the screening tool, and were you know the development of standard work instructions, so making sure that that was clear to everybody, that they um, weren't being done differently in different places, um, the actual process of screening was similar. And then we needed to figure out if we could align it with um, other existing processes or tools that we had within the hospital, and part of that embedding process. So for an example, in our um, emergency department, we aligned there um, with screening being done, of course, at triage. As you know, the literature says that's where time zero should start. And so um, we did embed it there. We implemented rescreening, of course, with status changes for the patient. And we planned an and on, so that little character um, was going to go into the electronic board within the ED so that there would be a communication to all in the department that there was a suspected sepsis or confirmed septic patient within the department. Um, and the other nice thing we did is we were able to combine the sepsis screening tool 
with the nurses assessment and documentation form, we redesigned that form and embedded sepsis screening into there, the results of it, and took the screening tool and made it a reference tool. So that worked out really well for us. Um, in the um, inpatient areas, we um, rejigged our flow sheet, and actually we've rejigged our flow sheet again. So this is uh, an iteration of our newest flow sheet. And so we have um, begun to use uh, the Pediatric Early Warning Scoring System, which is a tool that we've adapted from the National Health Service, and it really helps indicate when a child is deteriorating. And so, you know, as you know, the signs and symptoms of that can actually be very subtle. And this tool helps put those indicators together um, for the care provider to make it a little bit more um, apparent. And so the scoring is done each time vital signs are done or if you feel your patient's uh, status has changed. But at the bottom, what we've done is we have a um, little um, notice down there saying that you are to perform sepsis screening if your patient's Q's score has elevated um, at all or if they've um, developed a, a fever or actually they've cooled down. Um, it's uh, sort of an indicator then that you need to do that. Um, the rest of the scoring is based on um, behavior, respiratory, and cardiovascular parameters, or if the parent or the child, if they're old enough, or staff feel there is a concern, that also gets a point within the system. So there's actually actions for the nurse to do that embedded within this as well, depending on what the, uh, the score for the patient is. And so that was a nice alignment for us in that recognize as well. Okay, we also have aligned with uh, situation awareness in um, our inpatient areas. So this is new for us. This is something that we started uh, this winter. So um, while I'm talking about our old implementation, this is a little bit of a new piece, but I um, thought it was important to bring in. And so this um, patients at immediate risk is what we're looking at. And so we've got five different categories for that. And um, one, only one of these criteria are required or necessary to um, put that patient as identified at immediate risk. Um, none of the criteria is more important than the other, but um, it's you know a good place for the nurse to be able to uh, look at the patient subjectively and objectively. Cincinnati Children's has implemented this um, situational awareness, patient at immediate risk strategy. And what was interesting is they caught more septic patients when they were, from when they were just screening alone for sepsis using their sepsis bundle. So we've um, implemented with that as well. And so we're hoping the same thing will happen to us as happened to them. Um, with our um, oncology patients who come in with fever and neutropenia, we were able to align with them. Um, we already had a process in our emergency department and the oncology clinic for patients uh, that came in that way, they get automatically heightened to a C-test level 2. Uh, so we wanted to be able to review um, what their order sets looked like and make sure that um, we were sort of standardized so that regardless of how the patient kind of came in with fever neutropenia or whether they came in with sepsis, they would kind of get the same uh, blood work done. We would pull from the same anti empiric antibiotic guideline. And um, so it was really nice that we were able to, to standardize in that way with them. Um, we also, in the critical care area, were um, Patients, of course, are masked becoming septic because of the treatment they're providing or how sick they are, they're cooled, that sort of thing. They have a sheet that they use, their daily action plan, and that within there we decided that we would trend uh, white blood counts because we figured that would probably be a really good trigger for us to go ahead and screen um, the patient for sepsis or, or at least begin the conversation around what treatment are they receiving already, antibiotics, reviewing lines, those sorts of things that we trigger them to think, oh, the patient is septic and requires more intervention. So at the end of that, the result was, oh, um, we've actually got a poll question here. And it is the criteria for sepsis screening um, in <coughs> ED, although it could be anywhere, um, is A, fever, B, perforated organ, C, recent admission to hospital, D, immun immunocompromised, or E, presenting into the ED.
So again, if everybody could just uh, quickly answer that question and uh, Just give it another moment. And I'm going to close it now. And let's just share those results. So fever was 30%, uh, immunocompromised 20%, and presenting to the emergency department 50%. Oh, very good. Okay, so yes, for for us, with, with what we decided was that um, for sepsis screening in the ED, it was definite presentation to ED. So all patients um, are getting screened as they come into um, our hospital at this point in time. And then within that, we have on our screening tool, you can't really see it very clearly here, but of course I can always send it to anybody who'd like a closer look at it. There's um, infection risks in this category A, and so the, the fever piece and the um, immunocompromised are captured in there, absolutely. But uh, we are trying to do it with all of our, our patients. So in the end result of our testing cycles for the screening, we worked out who was going to be done, when we were going to do it, and how. And so on that left-hand side was the actual final result of what our screening tool looks like. And um, on the right-hand side is the actual process that we were following. Um, no matter whether we were in ED or up in the inpatient units, um, it didn't really matter the location. Um, it was the standard process we had agreed that we would all follow. <coughs> so the next question. Yeah, so there's a question. Yeah, so the question here. Um, um, if everybody wants to take a look at it, there's sort of a, a, a few questions within this one. Um, you can write your answers because we can't do it as a full question, of course. Um, if you could write an answer or a response into uh, your question uh, box in your control panel, that would be great if you have uh, something to add to this. If you have uh, any response at all, that would be great. So just type it into the uh, question panel. I'll give you uh, a moment or two to do that if you have some responses. So. The recommended medical management for severe sepsis includes fluid resuscitation, IV antibiotics, and blood work. So what is the recommended time frame to complete the above recommendations? And in what order would you complete the recommendations? So does anybody have, um, uh, you know, what they do at, at their organizations? And I'm not getting any responses here. <laughs> That's interesting when it's, you know, it's managed well everywhere. So. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not being facetious. Don't be shy, people. Yeah. Well, that's okay. So it's, it says uh, we've got a few answers now. Okay. I've harassed people into answering, so this is great. <laughs> so, um Kelly says, STAT completed as IV start and labs concurrently, then start all fluids and ensure cultures are sent uh, before antibiotics start it. And Lauren, unfortunately, uh, says, B unfortunately, I, I don't understand all the, the short forms for everything. So BW, then ABX STAT and fluid resuscitation. And then yep. somebody else, Tracy, recommended time frame one hour. Uh, Lauren, again, is within 20 minutes of identification. And Rhonda says, I would like the sepsis screen sheet. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> then we have uh, blood work, antibiotics. And Lauren has said, sorry, that's okay, Lauren, I should know more. Um, and Tracy, again, antibiotics uh, ASAP with fluids if delay in lab work. Fluid resuscitation. Oh, we got everybody's everybody's talking now. I'm oh, good. The interesting thing is there is a bit of variety in the answers. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. Well, Patricia, she put each of her answers sort of in one answer, so it would go blood work, antibiotics, fluid resuscitation within one hour. But right. They were in four different answers, so that's why it sounded, yeah. All right, well, very good on those answers. Um, 
So definitely um, what we were striving for when we first did this was in the first hour. And, you know, yes, we were trying to get the, the blood work, um, the cultures, of course, within that blood work, um, the fluid in there, and the antibiotics. And, um, you know, in a lot of cases, those things are done simultaneously almost. Um, but if we can get them done in the first hour, that's fantastic. There was originally very tight timelines, and <clears throat> the surviving sepsis 2012 um, guidelines have just come out. And um, there's actually a slightly different recommendation in there, and we haven't adjusted ourselves to that just yet. That will be work for this year. So interesting to know that everybody is doing similar and yet slightly different things. Okay, so with our um, response, so now that we've screened our patients and we figured that out, we then needed to figure out, okay, once you've found out the patient uh, could be septic, what do you do next? And so we had back in 2010 a, um, within our flow sheets a process called the escalation of patient care, which was um, an early warning system that we had adapted for our hospital and it involved a tool that was um, not a validated tool and it was a little bit more cumbersome where um, you, again, when you did your vital signs, you scored your patient on you know, behavioral, respiratory, and cardiovascular uh, criteria. And after you scored them, you, there was actions um, that were connected to that. And, and then there was an algorithm on the back of that that uh, was fairly complicated and, and hard to follow for both clinicians and um, nurses about who they were going to call when after hours. And, um, but we used that tool for quite some time, and we have then have transitioned into um, removing that form and creating or using the pediatric early warning scoring system, which is just a much more simplified um, screening tool and um, much cleaner to use, more straightforward, and it's a validated tool. And it's, um, it has a very nice um, actual response piece at the bottom in terms of who you call to um, get some um, support with a patient. So that is what we did there. Um, also with response, of course, we came up with um, a two order sets, one for the suspected uh, sepsis patient and an algorithm to go with that one, and, uh, and a critical care maintenance order set with an algorithm for it. And of course, what we tried to do was incorporate our audit pieces in this so that um, we could actually use the order set to go from time zero and see how fast the pieces were being done. And um, we thought that was a good idea. The other thing that we um, incorporated was, um, or added this year, is the idea of daily management. And um, the slide that I had for that has seems to have disappeared. But um, it basically is about taking that patient at immediate risk criteria and the Pew scoring that the nurses are doing and actually having a conversation every four hours, the charge nurse with um, the bedside nurse about their patient. And so they talk about those things that they've identified for the patient at being at risk. And if that patient um, is deemed to be at risk, for any reason, they highlight um, that patient's name in red or their room number, actually. And they then have a conversation about how they're going to go ahead and mitigate those factors to actually um, you know, catch the patient early and get them back on track. And um, so that conversation gets um, done every four hours as needed. It gets um, escalated if they need more support. Um, daily, the program manager also comes and talks to the charge nurse with our access and utilization manager, again, about uh, patients being in the appropriate places, flow through the hospital, are they meeting um, discharge um, target dates um, in, within that discharge planning. And, um, and we've also got a weekly conversation that happens now with our director who comes to also talk about um, the patients and how things are um, moving along with our daily management and um, those patients at risk. And so um, that seems to be you know, working well. It's early days for it. We've just finished our, our education and our implementation for that piece of things. 
So Deb, um, I'm sorry to interrupt again. I just have uh, uh, somebody in the audience who was uh, unsure about what uh, PDSA was. So if you could just maybe give a little. Absolutely. So PDSA stands for Plan, Do, Study, Act. And so it's a cycle, a continuous cycle, where you do, it's for testing. And so you plan what you think your test is going to be. You go out there to the front line and do some testing, actually use whatever your strategy that you've come up with, be it a form, be a different way to do some work. You do it uh, all the time, actually looking at how well that's working. So you study that and say, did that work? Do we need to tweak it a bit? Go back out and do a bit more testing. And so, and then that's where your acting piece comes in. So it's a continuous cycle of actually planning it, doing it, studying it, and then acting upon that. And um, so that's how we worked with this um, whole process of taking our our problem of sepsis screening, treatment, and recognition, all those responding pieces and referring pieces, and developing our tools. So we took them to the staff within this Kaizen. They practiced them, they put them out there, they did them, we tweaked them, and then put them in, embedded them into their um, their actual daily work. Is that a little bit clearer on what that is? Uh, I think it's a good explanation. And All yes. right, then. Yeah. So our next piece, our last piece we moved into was refer. So this was um, working a little bit more with the patient. So now that we've recognized their septic, we're responding to them in terms of either we're increasing vital signs or we're, we're going to call somebody. It's also how do we refer them on to a higher level of support or how do we bring those higher levels of support to actually come and actually assess the patient as well. And so our idea was to align this again with our patients at risk and our daily management. And so it really reinforced our escalation process and it um, really did help us with the conversations that we needed to have with the uh, um, critical care team and our first responders in our hospital who um, work after hours to um, attend to patients who need extra support. And so this little picture here um, is sort of a visual representation of how we have combined um, the whole pews, um, piece which, you know, sepsis screening is embedded in and then the patient at immediate risk with our whole um, um, daily management. And so it, it's just a little picture there going on on the left with the circle, all the things that the nurse is looking at in terms of those five criteria. Um, so you only need one or more of those factors if they're present um, to be putting your patient at immediate risk and then checking in with your charge nurse and informing her who has these visual tools, visual cues, which is highlighting in red, and then updating with the program manager um, and checking in there, and then from there, you know, coming up with strategies to mitigate um, whatever the concern is for that patient or moving that patient to a, a higher level of support. So at the end of our Kaizen, we had taken a whole bunch of places where we had gaps or inconsistencies or delays and actually had tightened those up um, so that we had a process that was going to work for us a whole lot better. <clears throat> so our accomplishments at the end of this was that we had developed a screening tool that was part of our standard work. Um, we had highlighted the usefulness of existing processes and tools we had already in place, and we strengthened some, such as uh, the oncology and fever neutropenia stuff. Um, in Respond, we had come up with our, our order sets and algorithms and um, had those out there for use. And, and in the referral piece, we had clarified with critical care their role as a responder to come up and, can, and screen the patients um, for, you know, clinicians who were concerned but just not sure um, where to go with the patient, trying to catch them early and um, treat them or move them to that higher level of um, service that they needed. So question. So uh, again, what ideas do you have for successful implementation of the sepsis bundle in your center? And again, you can, if you have uh, any answers or any input on that, just write it into your question box in the, uh, in the control panel. 
and we'll just give that a few minutes. And um, for uh, just so that everybody knows, we are uh, recording this presentation, so it will be up on Cassie's Knowledge Exchange Network for you to refer to later, and we will post the slides there as well. And um, and I think that uh, Deb and BC Children's Hospital is uh, happy to share their resources uh, with everybody. Absolutely. So I don't see anybody putting anything in. So well, that's okay. Um, have, sure. um, all your ideas are good, so it's probably. Yeah, and I think that it's it. Well, we it might be easier just to have a conversation at the end. So let's yeah, uh, for sure. go ahead. Yeah. That's just fine. So for us, well, there's another question here as well. It's about barriers. So what do you imagine could get in the way of your success? So maybe these are just things that we could you can think about, and then we'll talk mm -hmm. about them at the end. Very good. So for us, the lessons learned, uh, we had some surprises because we um, found out that 75% of the areas that we worked in um, actually really valued the screening tool and um, the whole idea of some standardization. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was a really great thing. And we also were surprised at the linkages between other processes that we had already existing in the hospital. So that was really nice for us to have been able to actually um, utilize those. The other thing we learned was that when we were using our escalation of patient care documentation, because it was more cumbersome, um, the actual staff were doing it in retrospect. And so the actual cue then to screen for sepsis wasn't there because it wasn't until they sat down to actually document on their patient that they added up the score and then went, oh. So the, that cue wasn't working. It was really the clinical cue that they were getting from the patient that was actually alerting them that there was something wrong with the patient. So um, that was part of the impetus for us to actually um, move on and take um, and do the PEW scoring, the validated tool with the flow sheet where it's embedded right into it and they can see if the patient is out of the vital sign norms because of the shading that's actually on that vital sign sheet. Um, the other thing we noticed was that we had a lot of change hitting staff at once. We were moving into accreditation and um, we also had with our strategic action plan lots of projects on the go and so we were actually causing some change fatigue with our staff. Um, so that was also new to us that we need to look at organizational readiness a little bit more um, before we start launching into really large projects to make sure that it's um, going to be successful. And the other thing was that measurement's a challenge. We, you know, had some areas where um, they don't want to comply and compliance is low and, and continues to be low because they do feel that they do this work already. So to highlight for next time, communication. We did tons of it, but we need more of it um, and, and targeted, definitely. And um, as I said, the measurement challenges definitely are ongoing and we need to... Um, continue to target those. Um, just, I think that's it. A few references here for anybody if they are interested. I have um, certainly tons more, but these are just a few that I have put up. And, um, and that's about it. Thanks so much, Deb. I think that this has been really um, informative. I think it's a uh, a good demonstration. I appreciate your your frankness because I think it's a, a demonstration of a bit of a reality check on on how challenging um, putting in um, you know a standard work really can be in an organization, especially when you're trying to roll it out uh, hospital wide like you did. Um, that said, though, I think you 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 stand to really reap the rewards. It's uh, but I I, I personally um, can relate to a lot of what you said, particularly around um, the pushback that you might have received along the way, um, the change fatigue, um, you know, the number of changes going on at once. Because I think that's something that probably resonates with everybody here. Mm -hmm. uh, at this point, I'd like to open it up to uh, our leader, our, our listeners, to. Um, uh, any questions that you might want to ask. Um, 
Lisa, what's the best way for them to uh, pose their questions? Sure, today? again, just, just type your questions into the question box, or you can raise your hand, and if you have a working mic, I can uh, unmute your line, and you can we can uh, participate in a live chat. But I do have one question here, and it's how, uh, how, how would you determine organizational readiness? Oh, there are, there's a couple of tools that you can use. Um, one is uh, called the DICE tool. And um, again, it's, it's a pretty simple tool. It's kind of divided into four quadrants. And um, so it's based, I can't remember all of it right now because I don't have it in front of me. But um, it basically says that you know, uh, there's sort of low interest or low motivation or high interest or high motivation. Um, so it actually puts you into these four quadrants. And you, from there, can kind of determine, based on what's going on within your organization, whether it's a good time to do this or not. But there are some other tools out there that you can, if you just Google um, organizational readiness, um, that you can find. Oh, that's a great suggestion, actually. That's really neat. Yeah. Quite a useful tool. It might tool. even be something that if we can uh, get a hold of a, a one-pager or some background info that we can post on the Knowledge Exchange Network, too. Mm-hmm. For sure. I can always send something. Excellent. Lisa, it's Elaine. May I, may I ask a question? Absolutely. Go for it. Thanks, Tracy. Um, great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, Claire, when, you, know, you mentioned a couple of things in terms of uh, implementing this sort of uh, across the organization. Things that I picked up in, in your presentation, Deb, along clarification with the PICU, um, the rollout in emergency, and then, of course, um, I don't think you spoke as much, but I'm sure there were unique processes and challenges within individual units or clusters. Mm -hmm. Can you just comment on, I'm sure the, these were all different challenges, and, and where were the greater challenges, um, depending on the area of the organization um, you targeted mm -hmm. your rollout to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for us, definitely one area of, um, of challenge, actually, was our oncology inpatient area. Mm. Um, because, as they felt very much, very strongly, that they are um, screening and constantly watching their patients for sepsis all the time. A and in truth, they are, and they do. But they didn't want to actually write it down or standardize the way they did it. And um, that was our frustration, because they didn't see the value in it, because they felt that they were eagle eyes and on top of it all the time. And so we had to do quite a bit of talking and um, work with them to say, you know, please you know, begin to use the screening tool, because you might begin to catch some of your patients sooner than you already are. Right. And um, so that was a definite um, challenge. The other area, actually, that was slightly challenging was the critical care area as well. I wonder about, yeah. Yeah, they, they feel very strongly, again, that that's sort of a, a part of their daily rounding conversation. And yet those are the patients that grunge along, that, you know, the nurse says, well, you know, they're running a low-grade fever. And somebody says, well, let's add this antibiotic. And, oh, maybe we should rewire a line. And they don't actually bundle the care together and actually say, OK, you know what? This patient's septic. We should probably do x, y, and z and um, give them some fluid and, and change their lines and, and look at the antibiotics as a bundle rather than days of letting them grunge along and then finally say, man, this kid is really sick. So they were, um, they were difficult to uh, convince um, and in the beginning. Um, I, I have a question. This is Lisa again. Um, I'm just wondering about, so clearly you're an acute care hospital, and I'm just wondering about um, what about in the community and when, you know, kids are discharged or and things happen, is there some sort of process in place for that? Is there... Is that a great question? Yeah. That was so, a great question. Sorry, Lisa. I didn't mean yeah. to cut you off there. Um, what we have done at this point in time is on um, Child Health BC, who uh, we work in partnership with at Children's, we have posted the um, tool onto the Child Health BC website. Mm -hmm. And through um, 
the, uh, there's a collaborative called um, E2E, which is sort of with the BC Patient Safety Quality Council. Um, they have done a collaborative on sepsis uh, a number of years ago. And so they had worked with the provincial community emergencies, but with an adult focus on sepsis. And so we've connected in with them to also have the pediatric sepsis screening tool and bundle components posted together so that the um, community EDs can go to that site and pull down the pediatric stuff as well as the adult. So they've got it for whichever patient they need. So from there, they can use the screening tools, and um, they would then contact um, ICU for um, advice and referral down if necessary. And that's a, like you said, that's a public site, so? It is a public site. Okay. Mm -hmm. But we could do, uh, I think, a whole lot more work on um, actually going out and connecting closely, more closely with those people in those departments. So, so Elaine, this might be an opportunity for you to uh, talk about what we're doing here at CAFC. Absolutely, and and uh, I was I was sort of we just said between the two of us we can we can uh, we can do this for sure. So just very briefly, Deb, I, and for mm -hmm. everyone, um, this is so relevant, and this work is so relevant and important to all of our CAFC members. As part of our pediatric practice guidelines collaborative sepsis, um, after a very um, comprehensive. Um, consultation process uh, rose to the top as one of our one of the four priority areas in the development of new uh, not new guidelines but national guidelines uh, sepsis is actually one of our four priorities complex care transition and pain are the other three so um, there's there's so much of what you've presented uh, Deb today that is highly relevant to the work Lisa's excellent question around connecting sort of that, that community piece and discharge and follow-up has also been flagged at just some of our initial um, teleconferences with our community of practice members as, as a real need, as, a, as an area of risk right now um, in terms of um, systematic, if you will, uh, follow up when when patients are discharged. So okay, that's funny. It's not my dog. <laughs> it is mine, and I'm not sure why. <laughs> we often say dogs are welcome to the collaborative. That's right, and they have seen <laughs> well, it many you. times. Go ahead. <laughs> um, but I, I just wonder, uh, first of all, Deb, I'd, I'd like to, um, and I, I'm sure Lisa has done this, I'd like to extend an invitation to you, to your uh, colleagues with, within BC Children's Hospital. Tex Kassoon is, Dr. Kassoon is one of our leads um, in, our, in our sepsis COP. But um, to really, uh, I'd like to invite many more of you, you know, you and your colleagues to come and be a part of that. I think there's a lot for us to learn and maybe transition to a national perspective from the work that you've done and led at BC Children's. And that's the whole idea of the of the community of practice. Mm -hmm, exactly, and and yes, absolutely, would be uh, thrilled to be a part and to have others join within our uh, our hospital to uh, support this process. And I and I'd really like to extend that invitation really to everyone who's participating today on the patient safety collaborative webinar. Um, if this is an area of interest, passion, need. Come and come and be a part and and help us make a difference at a system level across the country. Deb, I, I just wonder if you could comment, just elaborate a little bit. You know, in terms of the screening tool, um, which is something else that was flagged as being so important. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that follow up piece. Uh, one of the things that we're learning is is this is a huge risk. The risk as a as an inpatient within an acute center, the risks are um, great as well uh, post-discharge and, and within community and follow-up. Any, anything to add to that in terms of the work that you're doing? 
It's connected um, to the community, but I'm wondering about very specific sort of follow-up uh, guidelines or practices within uh, what you've implemented. So it, it, that's a good question, but specifically with, with sepsis, we have not attached a, um, a follow-up piece as per se, but what we do in the emergency department is any patient that um, has been treated, there is always information given to the family about the fact that if it, for any reason you know, these signs or symptoms appear, the child doesn't you know, get better, the, the signs and symptoms worsen, um, something develops, they are meant to return back to the emergency or to phone, um, which of course they'll be told to come back in. Um, and if they're not within our vicinity, then of course it would be to go to the closest emerge to them. Um, so we always give that piece of advice and information to them when they, they leave. But as far as sepsis goes, no, that to me is a real, um, that would be a real gap and a real opportunity to actually uh, to do some more work. Because that was really flagged, uh, among many other things, that was flagged as a real need and gap for sure. Lisa, I'm sure mm -hmm. you would concur with that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. no, we we'll just very flagged that as maybe something we can, we can work together on. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I wonder if it's an opportunity to swing back to the question that was in the presentation around um, any ideas uh, for success or barriers that may have been considered by any of the participants on the call in their particular organizations. Um, it was just, you know, it's, it's nice to know you're not alone when you're trying to, to um, deal with these challenges on, on such a complex issue. Um, and uh, if there's anybody that feels that they'd like to highlight a challenge that they might have had to address or are in the process of trying to address, um, by all means, uh, feel free to sort of spring forward. And I, you know, we all want to know about what's worked well in your areas too. And just to let everybody, there's been a few questions about uh, sharing of the information uh, um, that you know that Deb has uh, brought forward. And yes, uh, we will be able to share that on. Uh, it'll be put up on the Knowledge Exchange Network, and I will let everybody know how to find that uh, in an email um, in the next couple of days. So. Uh, just so that you know that, because people are looking for the sepsis screening and Pew scores uh, form. Right. Yeah. So those are very good. I'm yeah, happy to share those. Yeah, because I can send them along as um, as larger documents as well, so that they're not as tiny as what's in the uh, presentation. Excellent. And I think I'm just repeating what what um, Tracy had um, uh, had suggested, but. Under our, again, pediatric practice guidelines collaborative, there is a, a virtual home on our knowledge exchange network. So targeting these tools um, uh, right into the COP site, um, the community of practice site, would, would, be, would be wonderful as well if you'll allow us to do that, uh, Deb. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, from Tracy, I guess one of your colleagues, so Deb, could you mention the NHS public access for PEWS? There you go. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, if you go to the NHS site, you can get into their pews and download their documents. They're readily available, absolutely, and they're, they're happy for you to, um, to take them. And, and, you know, if you're going to use them, it's probably best to keep them as a validated tool, um, as we've learned, but um, they're happy to share. And again, maybe we can put that link up on our Knowledge Exchange Network. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Deb, one of the things that I'm sort of left with wondering, because you, you've done a great amount of work, um, how do not you, alone? <laughs> oh, I'm appreciating that. I guess how how do you see um, sustaining some of the changes? And, uh, because I, it, it's not lost on me at all the fact that you've managed to do this. Um, sort of of an organizational wide approach. It, you know, it's very easy to start in one area and and just kind of, you know, you put all your energy into that one area that often you have a lot of challenge even moving it out. So the fact mm -hmm. that you've done that is great. I guess, how do you keep this going on an ongoing basis? What's going to be right. the it, it, Good question. So it's definitely a challenge. And so what, what I've learned um, is that there are a lot of different uh, centers that have um, a sepsis lead nurse. 
and it's an actual position. And so that individual seems to be the person who continues to sort of drive things, follow up, make sure the auditing is happening and making sure the feedback loop back to the staff occurs. And so um, you need a physician lead as well, a champion. And so those two things are, I think, quite vitally important. That um, because if you are trying to maintain it within your hospital, it isn't owned by any one area. Because as you say, it's sometimes easy to implement in an area where there's interest, and then it doesn't go any farther than that. Or because it was so crafted uniquely to that one area, it then becomes really hard to actually take it out and, and move it. So our strategy with trying to standardize and embed was quite good. Our challenge now with sustainment has fallen to our quality and safety leaders to do um, auditing of uh, screening and then actually review, well they don't review, I do, I review the cases that actually end up down in the um, ICU to look at um, the bundle components and, and how we met them. And um, so that's an ongoing um, concern. Physician champion wise, um, we need a little bit more support with being able to go to those practitioners who are deviating, and it could be rightly so, but to have the conversation about the standardization of practice and, and um, when we need to stay true to the actual bundle or whether you know, it's appropriate depending on the patient to actually deviate. But um, that's where the sustainment has sort of fallen to um, quality safety leads and then sort of me and, um, and then, of course, text, and, um, and then tried to target uh, in the emergency and the ICU and a physician lead upstairs. Um, but, of course, they also have competing priorities, so hard to keep that on the, the top of their list. Is but, it, yeah. is it a, um, a, an indicator that gets reported um, at any particular level in your organization? Um, it doesn't get reported um, up to the... Ministry, or ministry level at this point because it's only patients above the age of 18 that have sepsis reported. Yes. Um, but we do uh, report up through our strategic action plan to the okay. executive. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's fantastic. Um, are there any other questions out there that uh, you might want to take the opportunity to, um, to put out into the, into the forum right now? Uh, Somebody just made another comment. So, Deb, I believe uh, daily management will greatly improve sustainment with required and expected check-ins. Yes, and that's that's incredibly true, and that's a really great point. And that was probably a colleague of mine that actually yeah. wrote that. Uh, <laughs> effect. And so, um, because that ongoing conversation is now going to occur between charge nurse, program manager, and the director, that definitely is going to um, keep is much more a, a focused part of the conversation, and um, so it really will help with sustainment for darn sure. It will be an interesting, I guess, next conversation might end up being, um, and I don't know if you have this or others, it might be a topic for a future CAPC um, patient safety collaborative call, is the whole topic of then antimicrobial stewardship. And so these kids are now on these antibiotics. Um, do we have them on the right ones? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, for the right length of time and so on and so forth. That's yeah, a conversation for another day, probably. Yeah. Right. I think we've talked about that in the NICU. That uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, so Very I good. think yeah. we're we're pretty much at the end of our time right now. Yeah. So, um, barring any other last comments, maybe perhaps I would just like to say on behalf of the CAFC Patient Safety Collaborative, Deb, thank you very much for your your great presentation, thought-provoking, um, uh, gives hope to areas that think that they don't have that consistency that they might like to uh, to try and, and use some of the, the tips and tricks that you've uh, managed to implement in BC Children's. Uh, and of course, if anybody has any ongoing questions, uh, feel free to use the contact information that Deb has uh, provided in her presentation. I'm sure she'd be happy to answer questions. Absolutely. And uh, and then certainly we hope to hear you, um, we hope to hear and, and, and have you, your participation at our next uh, Patient Safety Collaborative call on uh, Friday, April 26th. Also, a final note, uh, please watch for the CAFC Presents newsletter. That will provide information on all of CAFC's webinar presentations and where you can find the archived presentation. So any last words over to... Uh, 
to Elaine Orbine and Lisa Stromquist. Just a great big thank you, Deb, uh, for an excellent presentation, and to everyone uh, for your active participation as well. Well, thank you very much for allowing me to present. It was a pleasure. Sounds great. Thanks so much, everybody, and have a great weekend. And if we don't talk to you before Easter, have a great uh, long weekend next weekend. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Tracy. Bye. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Oh, you're